Okay, hi guys. Uh, I'm sorry for the delays. Uh, the room where I am supposed to give this lecture was uh, not available in the first moment, so I had to throw out the people that were here before. Um, uh, that's of, because of a cultural difference that here the lecture start uh, ten minutes past. Now. Okay, meanwhile, some of our students can arrive. Here. Okay. Uh, can you hear me and uh, see me? Yes, we can. Hello. Can you please tell me if you have a clear picture and if you can hear me? Yes. Yes, we, we can, can hear you. you. I don't hear anything. Oh, my loudspeaker was off. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay. I have activated my loudspeaker. Can you now tell me if you can hear me? Yes, yes we, we can, can hear you and see you. And we can see you. Okay, good, good. Okay, so um, welcome to the last part of this mini course on virtual synchronous uh, machines. And uh, uh, I remind you that this is a very basic uh, introduction to the concept of uh, virtual synchronous machines. We are basically only going through the, uh, to explain what is the idea and what is the basic structure of such a virtual synchronous machine. We will uh, omit uh, or uh, ignore many, many technical details that uh, appear when you, when you actually build such a machine. Uh, so we, we are not, uh, this course will not teach you how to make one. It's only uh, the basic ideas, okay? So we have started uh, um, in the previous part of this lecture, in the second part, we have uh, uh, started to derive the equations of uh, uh, synchronous machine, yes? And uh, let me uh, very briefly recap uh, what we have, uh, uh, the conclusions that we have reached. So, uh, we have uh, obtained that the electric, the equivalent electric uh, diagram of a synchronous machine, and I am only talking here about a simplified model, uh, is the following. So we have a voltage source, which is called the synchronous, synchronous internal voltage. which is a voltage induced in the stator windings due to the rotation of the rotor. So the rotor field is rotating, meaning uh, that it uh, induces a variable uh, magnetic flux in the stator windings. And then the minus the derivative of this uh, magnetic flux in the stator windings will be the synchronous internal voltage induced in the stator windings. So I draw here uh, one phase. We have three phases and I have written here EA, which means I am drawing the picture of phase A. But of course you have exactly the same picture for phase B and for phase C. Then we have an equivalent inductor, which we have denoted by LS and an equivalent resistor, which we have denoted by RS. And from here exits a current IA, so the current of phase A, which goes to the grid voltage on phase A. So VA is a grid voltage where this generator is uh, connected. Well, I call it grid voltage, but of course it doesn't have to be a grid. It can be just a load. You can connect this just to a load or to whatever circuit you want. 
remember that we have obtained this LS as being L plus M, where L was the self inductance of a phase or uh, of a stator winding, and minus M was a mutual inductance between two different stator windings. I don't repeat why we obtained this, but uh, from some computations we did last time, we obtained this. And uh, RS is just uh, a usual resistance of uh, one state or winding. Now, uh, let's see. Uh, we have already started to talk about uh, the mechanical equation of uh, the uh, synchronous machine, uh, which is derived from uh, Newton's law. And it looks like this, uh, the moment of inertia, so this is a moment of inertia of, the, uh, of everything that rotates together with the rotor. So you have the rotor of the generator, but it may be connected to some prime mover to let's say a gas turbine or a water turbine. And all everything that's rotating together has a moment of inertia, which we call J. And this uh, uh, J times the derivative of the angular velocity gives us the sum of all the torques that, that act uh, on this uh, generator. So uh, there are basically three torques, Tm plus Td minus Te. I have to explain uh, all three. I think that I have already started last time to explain what they are. I'm not sure how far I got, uh, but okay. These two, these two TM and TD together, let me mark that here, these two together are the active torque which comes from the prime mover. Prime mover torque. Is that visible, readable? Okay. So the, what is a prime mover? The prime mover is the engine which uh, uh, rotates the generator. So it can be, for example, a diesel generate, a diesel uh, engine, or it can be a steam turbine, or it can be a water turbine. It is a machine which gives the mechanical power to the rotor. Yes, these two components. I will explain what each of them is. And TE is the electric torque. This is the electric torque. And you see that it appears with a minus sign because this is a torque which opposes the movement. So it acts to slow down the rotor, this, this one. Uh, it acts against the movement of the rotor. And this electric torque is uh, uh, due to the interaction of the magnetic field of the rotor and the magnetic field of the stator. The stator, um, there are currents flowing in the stator. And if this generator is giving power to the electricity grid or to whatever circuit that is here receiving this current, then uh, this, uh, uh, by the law of conservation of energy, this energy must come from somewhere. And this energy comes by taking it away from the energy of the rotor. So it will be uh, uh, the, the uh, action of these magnetic fields will be such that it will oppose the movement of the rotor. And then the power which flows from the generator to the electric circuit of the stator is precisely this torque times the angular velocity omega. So you know that in general in mechanics, the power which is transmitted through a rotating axis is a torque times the angular velocity omega. So this Te times omega Te times omega is equal to the power flowing, power flowing to the state of circuit. 
And uh, be careful, I said here to the state of Turkey, I did not say to the Greek, because some of this power, a small, a very small proportion of this power is actually consumed locally uh, by this resistor. This resistor will uh, heat up and so it will um, uh, dissipate some of the power that is being transmitted to the uh, state of circuit and the remaining power will indeed flow uh, to the grid. Now let's uh, see precisely what are these two components that uh, uh, come from the prime mover. So <coughs> typically the uh, component Tm is a constant. So it, it doesn't have to be constant, but it would be typically constant. And if it is typically constant, then how is it computed? Uh, it is computed based on the amount of power that the owner of this prime mover wants to um, uh, transmit to the grid. So the prime mover uh, is part of some sort of power generating station. And uh, whoever operates this power generating station wants to sell to the grid a certain amount of power. Uh, the considerations for how to decide this amount are commercial and we do not discuss it. He, de he decides he wants to pump a certain amount of power, of course, uh, under the assumption that he has this power available. He has a certain, he wants to pump a certain amount of power. And the equation by which this Tm is uh, computed is uh, the following. Uh, Tm times omega, uh, so torque times angular velocity, that would be the total power going uh, from the angular, uh, sorry, from the prime mover to the rotor, right? Now, this power will be, will, uh, will be uh, divided in an unequal way between the uh, power that actually flows to the grid. And for that, you have a certain desired value, the set value of the power that the operator of the power station wants to send to the grid. And then you have to add to this also the power that will be lost on this resistor. So the power lost on this resistor has a relatively more complicated expression. It is RS times P set squared plus Q set squared. I'm sorry, I did not tell you what is uh, reactive power. It will come in a moment. I will tell you what is reactive power, Q, uh, divided by E squared. Uh, I, I, I am now realizing that I have not yet defined these quantities here. So this formula, um, I, I will explain this formula later. This okay? is the same as the what? Uh, no, 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 it's not the same. It's, it's related, but it's not the same. Uh, I, okay, I will explain this formula a in a few minutes, not now, because I have not yet defined uh, these terms. So just remember that this is a constant that the owner of the prime mover uh, decides according to some formula that I will explain you in a few minutes. Now, uh, let's see the droop torque. This is called the droop torque. Droop torque. This droop torque uh, is another component of the torque generated by the prime mover. And its uh, purpose is to stabilize the grid. This is very important for a grid in which you have several uh, large generators to maintain the stability of this grid, and not only to maintain the stability, but to maintain the frequency in a certain range. The frequency for an uh, electricity grid is has to be kept in a very narrow range. That is how the regulations in uh, every country uh, are. And uh, the reasons for that are uh, um, somewhat unclear to me, but from what I understood, 
uh, the reason that they keep the the frequency of the grid in a very narrow range is to avoid vibrations of the generator. So the uh, maybe many of you have had this experience of uh, um, operating the washing machine. And then uh, the washing machine runs quite well and quietly. And then when it is, uh, I am talking uh, um, the spin cycle, when the washing, when the, uh, your laundry has to rotate very fast. So it rotates very fast and quietly. And then when the spin cycle is finished, then uh, it starts slowing down because it, uh, you no longer operate a motor. So it, uh, by friction, it loses its energy and it slows down. And during this time, when the uh, uh, laundry is slowing down, you may notice that the machine starts shaking very strongly. Uh, have, have, have you noticed this phenomenon? Uh, am I the only one here who, who says this? Yeah. Can you? Have you also noticed that? Okay, so why is that? Because uh, the, this mechanical uh, setup of the laundry the machine uh, has several resonant frequencies. And uh, as the machine slows down, it, uh, it goes through all the possible frequencies from the original spin frequency down to zero. And as it goes down through all these frequencies, uh, it occasionally hits resonant frequencies, and then it shakes very violently because the uh, disposition of the laundry in your machine is not perfectly symmetric. You cannot put it in a perfectly symmetric way. So there is, there is always some uh, uh, force uh, trying to move it away from the from a smooth rotation around its axis. And uh, this uh, perturbation, which comes from the asymmetry of your laundry, uh, will have a very strong effect at the, at the resonant frequency. Now, there is a similar situation at large generators. Uh, they, uh, they can shake very violently if they are not at the correct frequency. So for this reason, uh, the power grid is operated in a very narrow range uh, in uh, most of Europe and also here in Israel, uh, this range is uh, typically uh, uh, plus minus half a percent. So uh, one percent would be half a hertz. So uh, one half of a percent that would be plus minus 0 0.25 hertz uh, around the nominal frequency of uh, 50 hertz. Now, how do the big generators uh, in an electricity grid maintain this uh, fixed frequency. So that is done with the help of this droop torque. So the droop torque is uh, uh, TD, is uh, a, a certain constant uh, times uh, omega uh, nominal minus omega uh, minus omega. So omega is the actual frequency of the rotor, and the omega n is a nominal frequency, nominal frequency of the rotor. No, sorry? Yes, so in, in the case of uh, uh, European countries, this uh, omega n would be 50 times 2 pi, yes, because it's 50 hertz, and this we are talking here. Uh, in angular frequencies, so that would be 50 times 2 pi, it's uh, 100 pi, yeah? So in most countries, it would be 100 pi. So how does this work? If the, let's say, the frequency of your generator is higher than it should be, If the frequency is higher than it should be, then uh, this difference will be negative, which means that this group torque will be negative. So it will 
align itself with the electric torque and will try to slow down your generator. So if it spins uh, too fast, then the droop will uh, try to slow it down. And of course, the opposite direction, if it spins too slow, then this is positive, and that means that you have to add. So the prime mover will add extra torque to the generator to try to uh, make it spin faster. Uh, so yes. this is like a proportional con controller. Uh, this is like a proportional controller, yes. But then uh, like for it to act really fast, GP has to be really high. Yes, GP is in actually very high. Uh, uh, so the, the usual standard by which uh, most uh, countries operate is that if the actual uh, frequency goes down by something between three and five percent, that depends on the setting of each generator. But let's say between if uh, omega uh, uh, omega n minus omega divided by omega n is uh, let's say it is three percent so in other words 0 0.03 if this ratio is 0 0.03 uh, which means a three percent drop uh, sorry sorry Okay, a 3% drop in frequency, uh, then the power has to go up uh, by a factor of two. Or equivalently, an equivalent way to put it, if this is equal to minus 0 0.03, so you're going in the opposite direction, then the power must become zero. Yes, it's a zero equivalent statement in one direction it goes up to being twice the nominal power and in the opposite direction it goes down to being the zero power so if the if the frequency increases by three percent then the power goes down from nominal to zero uh, so as i said this number of three uh, percent is not always three percent some generators have more some generators have no group uh especially small small generators sometimes have no group but uh, the most generators the big ones have uh, approximately uh, approximately this uh, this number so this as i said is required in order to stabilize the frequency of the grid to the nominal frequency and as i said this group constant dp dp the group constant is very big so a, a very small deviation in frequency causes a very large uh, amount of extra power now we come to the uh, electric torque now the electric torque is a is a long story uh, let me go back to the paper uh, from 19 from 2011. Uh, uh, okay, uh, you can uh, you can uh, think so. You, you you we can compute the total magnetic energy stored in all the windings of a synchronous machine so the synchronous machine in our simplified representation it has three stator windings and one rotor wind in this simplified representation because in reality there are some more windings i will talk about those a bit later in this simplified representation in which you have four windings you can say that um, the, um, the four fluxes which are phi a phi b phi c and phi f so this is phase a phase b phase c and the field field people call the uh, uh, the flux of the rotor they call it field for some reason so we have the 
these four fluxes, state or one, state or two, state or three rotor. Yeah? And they are obtained by some big matrix, let's call it L tilde, which is a four by four matrix, multiplied with the corresponding currents, IA, IB, IC, and IF. And we have actually written down this four by four matrix in the previous lecture, you, uh, so I don't repeat it. Yeah? And uh, there is a, a fact from uh, uh, electric circuit theory that the energy stored, the energy stored in a system of uh, uh, coils which have self inductances and mutual inductances like this is equal to one half the inner product between the fluxes and the currents. This is a fact from physics that this is the uh, this is it, the total magnetic energy, total magnetic energy in the machine. Uh, I don't know. For one for one inductor, it's pretty clear, right? That this is the case. If you if for one inductor. This, this phi would be, uh, well, <laughs> the same is true also for the system of inductor. So this, I can also write it as one half of uh, uh, Li, L tilde I, yeah? multiplied, this is a vector I, uh, multiplied with I, yes? Uh, and uh, you know that uh, if you take a single inductor, then you probably know that the energy in, in this inductor is one half L times I squared. Yes, in one inductor, you know. So this is now the generalization of that to an uh, n-dimensional inductor where you have uh, several currents flowing and the magnetic fields are interacting inside. Okay, now uh, let's see where do I have time? Uh, where do I have space? Okay, now we want to compute how the uh, uh, what is the torque developed by uh, the uh, by the system of coils, the rotors, uh, the rotor and the stator. This uh, this uh, 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 this this torque depends only on the magnetic fluxes because it's a torque produced by the magnetic fluxes. So it is a function purely of the uh, magnetic fluxes. Let me also express it also in a, an equivalent way. Uh, this matrix A tilde has an inverse matrix. It is a positive matrix. That's also a fact from physics that. Uh, if you express fluxes from currents, then this matrix must be positive. Why? Because if this is the expression of the energy, the energy must be positive. And so that means that this matrix must be a positive matrix. Okay, so it, it, a positive matrix is, inver it is invertible. So we can also write this in the following way. It's equal to one half. Um, now L times I, that's the fluxes. That's a vector of fluxes. Let's call this the vector of fluxes, okay? Times L till the inverse phi, yes? So I can write it just as well uh, in terms of the currents or in terms of the uh, fluxes. And uh, the, torque that is being developed 
uh, from physical considerations, that must be something that depends only on the fluxes. So it doesn't depend, for example, it doesn't depend on the uh, angular velocity of the robot. If you know the fluxes, it doesn't matter uh, what the velocity is. The, from the fluxes, you can compute uh, the torque because the flux, uh, the, the torque is something that acts instantaneously. It doesn't depend on how this uh, rotor is located. It is something that uh, it is a it is a result of forces that act at one instant of time, no matter how the machine is moving. Okay, <coughs> so we can now uh, do the following uh, strange experiment. Let's assume that uh, uh, let's assume that we have a, 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 a synchronous machine, and we uh, take care that the fluxes should be constant. Uh, so the uh, um, I, I, I should uh, I, I should have mentioned here something. I'm sorry. I should have mentioned that, uh, as you have seen in last lecture, this matrix depends on the angle theta. You remember the the mutual inductance between the rotor and certain state of fluxes depends on the angle theta. So I should write that this is an, a, a function of theta. Yeah. So. Everything is, I said, is correct, but keep in mind that this L tilde matrix is a function of theta. Now, let's make the following uh, sort experiment. Let's say that we take care for uh, all the fluxes to be constant. And uh, we let the machine rotate a tiny angle. Then Uh, so we have the machine at the initial angle and we let it rotate by a tiny amount d d d theta d theta is very small very small angle while keeping all the fluxes constant the fluxes depend on the current so we can externally connect uh, suitable current sources to this uh, uh, machine so that we keep artificially we keep the fluxes constant. Uh, so phi, the, the vector phi, yes, the vector phi is constant. And we rotate the machine by a tiny angle by keeping all the fluxes constant. What will now happen? There will be uh, uh, a certain uh, uh, energy that will be uh, released from this uh, magnetic uh, um, released or received. Wait a second. Uh, uh, so the, the change in, in energy, the change in energy, the change in magnetic energy. Uh, will be released, it can be positive or negative, this change in magnetic energy will be released, where will it be released? It will, so, so here comes a crucial point, it will not be released into the electric circuit. Why not into the electric circuit? Because if you keep the fluxes constant, then it means that the induced voltages are all zero because you know the induced voltage in every inductor is minus the derivative of the flux. So if you keep the fluxes constant, then it means that no voltages are induced on all these inductors and the power, the electric power released would be the induced voltage times the current. And since there is no induced voltage, uh, it means that there is no electric power release. So if these are constant, then it follows that uh, all voltages, all 
induced voltages. are zero and that implies that no electric power no electric power is leading this system of four inductors so if that is the case then where is the power going if it does not go to the electric circuit where is it going Acceleration. So it goes to the mechanical power. It, 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 it becomes mechanical power. All the power released from the magnetic field goes to mechanical power, which means it either accelerates or decelerates the rotor. So this change in uh, the change in uh, energy must be equal to whatever torque has been generated. Times uh, d theta. Yes, because there is no electric power, and so all the change in energy goes to mechanical power, which is this. Release. Does it not sigma d omega? Sorry. Does it not actually? No, no. D theta. Uh, d theta. Uh, the. The, the work done by a torque is equal to torque times angle. The work done is torque times angle. The power is, of course, work time is, uh, is torque times angular velocity. But the work means the energy is torque times angle. Release mechanical energy. Okay, so this means from this last equation, we conclude I'm going in an illogical way now, I'm going from down to up. So it follows, it follows that T, T, is the derivative of E with respect to angle when we keep flux is constant. Flux is constant. If you go into the paper by me and Zong from 2011, then you see this formula on in the right column of page 2261. Okay. Now comes the big trick. Uh, Let us uh, uh, represent. Uh, uh, so, so we have we have these formulas. E is this, and it is also equal to this. So, if I uh, take in this formula, I take the derivative. Sorry, in this formula, in this formula, I take the derivative with respect to phi. Then uh, that's very easy. Uh, Uh, no, no, I, I'm sorry, 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 sorry. No, 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 no. no. I'm sorry. I, uh, let, let me put here theta i. And this also depends on theta. Yeah. Uh, so I want to differentiate this expression or this expression with respect to theta. Which one is more convenient to differentiate with respect to theta? This or this? Well, this is cumbersome because I will change, but this one is very easy to differentiate because we have said that we keep theta constant. So if I look at this expression, 
I have here theta, uh, sorry, phi, I, I'm sorry. I keep phi constant, and then it's very easy to differentiate this with respect to theta, right? So I differentiate this expression with respect to theta. So let me do it here. So it is equal T is equal to, so one half. Now, the, the phi uh, is constant. So there is nothing to differentiate there. Here I have to differentiate L to the inverse of theta with respect to theta. And I have to multiply with this constant phi. Right? Yeah, I assume that uh, the way to keep fluxes constant is to keep i constant. To keep zero voltage. Ah, okay. I do that because that leads to zero voltages. And then I know that all the power goes to the mechanics. It goes to torque times. Uh, to mechanical work, which means torque times angle. Okay, so uh, uh, now comes here an interesting question. How do you differentiate the inverse of a matrix if you know to differentiate the matrix itself? Because in our case, we have, we know the expression of L of theta. I don't write it, but we have written it last in, in the previous lecture. We know what is L of theta. And L of theta, if you remember from last time, is some expression in which you have uh, um, cosine of theta. Or, or, or you have cosines of theta and then cosine of theta minus two pi over three and cosine of theta plus two pi over three. It's a relatively simple expression. It's easy to differentiate it. But now we have to take the inverse of that matrix and differentiate. Now that uh, makes it look very complicated. But in fact, uh, we have now the, I have to delete some of this stuff here. So if you have a, uh, function. This, this tilde, this tilde makes um, makes it ugly. Let, let's delete the tilde everywhere. I delete the tilde. You know that L is a four by four matrix. Okay. I delete the tilde everywhere. If you want, you can keep it. One more. Here. Yes. Okay. Okay. No. There is a formula which says, uh, okay, how do you how do you differentiate if you have a function f of theta, which is a, just a scalar function of theta, and you have one over f, how do you differentiate that? D over d theta. Okay, very simple question. Who can tell me? It's minus one over f squared. Minus, yeah, you tell me, yeah, one over f squared, f of theta squared, and what is on top? Uh, f derivative, f derivative, correct. So, this is how you differentiate one over a scalar function. Now, comes the question how do you differentiate the inverse of a matrix function? So it must be a generalization of, of that rule, yes? So the generalization is that it is minus L inverse of theta, the derivative of L with respect to theta in the middle, and then again, L inverse of theta. Yes, this is a, uh, the rule for differentiating the inverse of a matrix function. What, what is written here? You see, if L happens to be a scalar function, then this formula reduces to this formula, right? Uh, it's a nice exercise to prove it. It's not difficult, but I will not do it. 
So, uh, okay, let's now go back to uh, here. And so we continue the computation. So it is equal to one half pi. Now here I use this formula, which I have just derived. So it will be uh, minus uh, L inverse of theta. Then here comes the derivative of L of theta with respect to theta. And then again, L inverse of theta times five, right? What do we do with this now? Uh, we, I need place. I delete, uh, you, you have already written this, I hope, so I delete this. So what is this? What is this? L inverse times five. That's a current, right? Good. And what is this? This one, you know that in an inner product, you can move a matrix to the other side of the inner product and it becomes adjoint. I write this rule here. If you have Tx inner product with Y, that's the same as x inner product with t star y. Yes, this is a general rule. It's true for any matrix t. Yeah, and this rule, I will apply it now for the particular case when the matrix t is equal to L inverse of theta. But L inverse of theta is a self-adjoint matrix because it is a positive matrix. I mean, L of theta is a positive matrix, and therefore its inverse is also a positive matrix, and therefore it is self-adjoint. So that means that T star, the adjoint of it, is the same as the matrix itself. So that means that I can write this as being equal to one half. So this, this L inverse, I move it to the left side, I apply it to phi, that gives me I, right? The minus sign, comes out in front, minus, and what do I get? I, derivative of L of theta with respect to theta, uh, I, right? Yeah, this is the result. Now, this, if I think about it, if I go back here, you see, that's just the derivative of this expression with respect to theta when i is constant, right? So this is equal to so this is equal to minus the derivative, the minus, yeah, minus the derivative of uh, e with respect to theta, when I keep I constant. So the T, which is a derivative of the energy with respect to angle when flux is constant, is minus the derivative with respect to angle if instead of the flux, I keep the current constant. The difference is that it gets a minus sign. Okay, so why did I do that? Uh, because I can relatively easily differentiate with respect to uh, uh, when the current is constant. Because in this expression, you know that I know L of theta. It's a, it's a simple, simple expression. And I, so I keep I constant, then it's very easy to differentiate this with respect to theta. And I get the torque. So if we do that,
So you you have to remember what is uh, uh, so so let's let, let's write this uh, let, let's write what we are actually differentiating. So the, the electric torque the electric torque is equal to minus the derivative of the magnetic energy with respect to theta when we keep the currents all constant. All, so the currents meaning the three phases and the rotor current all constant. So now let's remember what is, uh, uh, what is this expression that we are differentiating. So it is the minus the derivative of what? So it is, um, uh, you, you see in this uh, expression, the inner product between, uh, so I write it here again, the magnetic energy is equal to the product between, uh, between Li and I. And the current, yeah. Sorry? What? It's correct, I was saying it along with you. Was in it along with it. Ah, okay. There's a one yeah. half, no? Uh, uh, one half, I'm sorry. Yes, the one half. Okay. <coughs> so we have to uh, put here uh, one half the inner product between uh, phi A, phi B, phi C with I A, I B, I C. That's the inner product between the first three components with the first three components. And then I have to take the inner product between the fourth component here with the fourth component here. That would be uh, um, um, phi F, the field flux multiplied with the field current IF, yeah? Oh, and I should close this back. And the derivative is taken with all the currents constant. All the currents constant. Okay, now. If you do that, and you take into here in this expression, you take into consideration precisely the expressions for phi A, phi B, phi C that we derived in the previous lecture and the expression for phi f that we derived in the previous lecture, then you obtain that this is equal to uh, mf if multiplied with the inner product between the current and uh, sine tilde of theta. Now, sine tilde of theta is a notation. It's a convenient notation that I have defined in the previous lecture, and it is equal to, sorry, to sine theta, sine of theta minus two pi over three, and then sine of theta plus two pi over three. Yeah. So if you do uh, the, if you take the expressions from last lecture, we have them for, for this and for this, you substitute and after two or three lines, you get this. So we have a simple expression for the electric torque, yes? So we have now clarified what is the electric torque. We have clarified also what is the loop torque, and uh, this here, I still owe you some explanation here. Uh, okay, so this is a mechanical equation of the, uh, of the synchronous machine. This, this equation in particular is called the swing equation. Swing equation. Now, in order to uh, advance, in order to, uh, um, uh, to remove the fog from this equation, 
I have to introduce uh, something called the Park transformation. So uh, this is a very useful tool. I'm sure that many of you already are familiar with this uh, Park transformation. So where can I do this? Let's say here. Oh, actually, we should take a 10 minutes break. So 10 minutes break. Okay, we continue the mini course on virtual synchronous machine. So I told you that uh, I have now uh, to introduce a park transformation. And I assume that many of you already know the park transformation. So uh, the path transformation is a unitary matrix defined as follows. Park transformation. U of theta. So this is a matrix which depends on an angle theta uh, is equal to square root of two over three times cosine of theta cosine of theta minus two pi over three, cosine of theta plus two pi over three. Then you have the same with sine. And then finally, you have a line with the constants, one over square root of two, one over square root of two, one over square root of two. And this matrix is unitary, unitary. What does that mean? It means that if U of theta multiplied with its adjoint, in any direction, so I can also put it in this order, is equal to the identity matrix. Yeah, this is what unitary means. And uh, another way to say the same thing is to say that the three rows of this matrix are an orthonormal basis in uh, in uh, R3 or in C3, it doesn't matter. In three-dimensional space, either, whether you take it real or complex, it doesn't matter. They are an orthonormal basis. And similarly, the columns of this matrix also are an orthonormal basis in, uh, in uh, R to the power three or also in C to the power three. So in three-dimensional space. Why do people who deal with power systems like this transformation so much? So first of all, the angle, you have, to, you have to define what is the angle. So in the case of uh, a synchronous machine, uh, this angle would be the rotor angle, like we already defined the rotor angle, uh, sorry, we already denoted the rotor angle by theta. So in a synchronous machine, you would use the rotor angle. If you analyze a power grid, then you would uh, find a sort of a phase angle of the grid in a certain point, and you could take Z as your angle theta. Uh, in a brushless DC motor, you would take again the angle of the uh, rotor of the machine to be your angle. So uh, this transformation is useful because it transforms very complicated equations into uh, much simpler equations. If you, deal, if you are dealing with synchronous generators or motors or uh, power systems, transformers and so on. And uh, this is sort of a miraculous transformation because uh, in the, if you write the equations of a synchronous machine, then you everywhere you have uh, sine theta and cosine theta appearing. But after you apply this 
uh, unitary transformation to uh, currents and also to voltages, then uh, somehow by a miracle, the angle theta disappears from the equation and you get much simpler equation. Uh, you will see that in a second. Now, um, let's, to, to illustrate this point, let us consider ideal grid voltage. So you know that our synchronous machine is connected to a power grid. And in principle, the voltages on this grid could be anything. But what is the ideal shape of the voltages that we would like to have on a power grid? It would be uh, like this. Bg, so the vector of uh, grid voltages that, in, that are in an ideal grid are of the form, uh, okay, Vga, Vgb, Vgc, sorry, Vgc. So the three phases would be equal to uh, square root of two over three. You see the same constant that appears here, multiplied with V, capital V, multiplied with sine tilde. Now you already know what sine tilde means because I wrote it somewhere, but meanwhile I deleted it, but you know what it means. Uh, uh, sine tilde of theta G, where theta G is what we call the grid angle. So the grid voltages also have a certain phase angle which is precisely what appears in these uh, equations. And uh, uh, this grid angle has a derivative. You know, when I put a dot on top of a variable, it means that I differentiate it with respect to time. So the derivative of the grid angle with respect to time is the grid frequency. And the grid frequency is usually very close to 100 pi, as we already discussed. Yeah? This V, this capital V here, is a so-called line voltage. Line voltage. This means that uh, you have here three phases. You take the voltage between two, three, between two phases and you take its RMS value. RMS means mean root square. Yes, you, I, I suppose everybody knows what is RMS. So this is equal to the uh, RMS value, root mean square value of voltage between two phases. Voltage, voltage between two phases. Now, if you have uh, such an ideal grid voltage and you apply to it the uh, path transformation, then you obtain the following. Apply the bulk transformation to the idea grid voltage. So you apply the path transformation to, to this vector Vg, which is defined here. This is a path transformation. The result will be the following. U of theta times Vg. So the path transformation applied to Vg is equal to uh, minus capital V sine delta 
minus capital V cosine delta and zero. So this is, uh, uh, oh, what is delta? Delta is equal to theta minus theta grid. So you compare the grid voltage with your local local voltage, yes? And this difference is called the power angle. It's a very important quantity, the power angle power angle if the power angle is positive it means that your synchronous machine is running a little bit ahead of the grid and if the power angle is negative it means that the machine is lagging behind the grid a machine which is producing positive power is always ahead of the <coughs> ahead of the grid. So the power angle is usually between zero and 90 degrees. Uh, it cannot exceed 90 degrees because if it if it goes higher than 90 degrees, the machine becomes unstable. We don't uh, discuss it now, but um, the region of stability of a synchronous machine when it's disconnected to the to a power grid is uh, uh, is a subset of angles contained between minus 90 degrees and plus 90 degrees. So you, you are not allowed to have an angle more than 90 degrees with respect to the grid. And uh, now, having understood this, this power angle is, uh, is changing uh, slowly. It is a slow variable. So it, is, it can be constant for a long time. And if you look now at the spark transformed uh, vector, you see that the, the first two components are almost constant. Let's say they are slowly changing variables. And the third component is zero. So there are uh, two advantages in using the spark transformation, which are true not only for these voltages, but they are true for any vector that you consider in a synchronous machine. One, you obtain variables which are very slowly changing, whereas if you look at the original variables, you, the original VGA, VGB, VGC, then you see here, this is a sign of the grid voltage. This changes very fast. So all the time, it is it, it follows the sine wave, right? So you cannot, so it, it is an oscillating quantity, right? But if you transform it, then the transformed quantities are almost constant. So, so it's much easier to follow them, much easier to monitor them, much easier <coughs> to control them because they are very slowly changing quantities. And another advantage is that while here you have three oscillating variables, here you have only two relevant variables and the third, the third variable is zero. So uh, first of all, you reduce the dimension of your control problem from a three-dimensional vector, which can be currents or voltages. You reduce it from three dimensions to two, and they are slowly varying. This is a big, uh, these are the two big advantages of the path transformation. Yes? So theta dot and theta dot G are almost similar because- theta dot uh, no theta dot theta dot is our uh, uh, angular frequency and theta g dot is the grid frequency omega g yeah, but they are this is grid frequency close. they are close of course grid frequency i mean if the machine is synchronized then, is then they are very close yes they are not equal but they are very close yes Okay, now, after having understood uh, this, uh, by the way, before I carry on, 
uh, you see this zero here. This zero is very convenient. Uh, it is true also for the drift currents because uh, if you remember last time, I told you that the common point of the three stator windings, which I denoted to be the ground of the machine, is not connected anywhere. It is simply not connected to the external circuit, which means by Newton, by uh, Kirchhoff's laws, it follows that <coughs> IA plus IB plus IC must be equal to zero because there is no, no way for the uh, uh, ground current to come back to the ground of the machine because it's not connected. And because of this, when you do the path transformation and you apply it to a vector of grid currents, then here you obtain square one, so some constant times IA plus the same constant times IB plus the same constant times IC, which means the sum of the currents, which is zero. So you obtain that the grid currents will also have a zero here. Yeah, the grid voltages have a zero here if it is an ideal grid. This is what I call an ideal grid. This is an ideal grid. Where did I write it? I did not write it. Okay, this is I ideal grid. Yeah. Ideal grid looks like this. A real grid, of course, can be much more ugly. It can contain unequal phases, which is called unbalanced phases, and it can contain um, uh, multiple harmonics of each sine wave, so that uh, if you uh, plot your grid voltage on the oscilloscope, you will see it's not really a sine wave, but it can have all sorts of distortions, for example, the top of it could be clipped or all sorts of other uh, uh, distortions could occur. So in, in a real grid, you don't have this ideal uh, grid, uh, grid voltages. And in particular, in a real grid, the, the third component of the part transformed grid may be not equal to zero. It is usually small, but it does not have to be zero. But for the currents, for the currents, the third component will be precisely zero because uh, it cannot, it has no choice because of this uh, equation. Now let's uh, uh, see what, uh, what do we get if we compute the power that the machine gives to the grid. Oh, sorry, sorry. I should have said something. After you apply this part transformation to any vector with three components, so it can be a voltage of uh, a vector of voltages in phases A, B, and C. It can be a vector of currents in phase A, B, and C, or some other currents, not necessarily at the grid connection, but in some other point. You have a vector of voltages or currents. And then you have the ABC components and you apply the part transformation. And again, you get a vector with three components. Those three components after part transformation are called the D component is the first, the Q component is the second, and the zero component is the third. So if you apply, uh, so this, this quantity here, we call it the D component, then the Q component, and then the zero component, yeah? So after path transformation, we have D, Q, zero. And usually we can neglect the zero component. So we work with D and Q components. Okay, I was saying that we want to compute now the power. The power that a synchronous machine sends to the grid.
It's just the terminology BQ and zero. It's just the name, yes. BQ and zero. The path transformation was introduced, I think, in 1929 by a gentleman called Park, of course. Okay. So the um, power that uh, any circuit with three terminals, the power that it generates is equal to VA IA plus VB IB plus VC IC. Yes, it is clear because on each phase, the power transmitted is voltage times current. And you add together the three phases. So it, it is this expression. Now I can write this as a scalar product between the vector of voltages and the vector of current. Okay, sorry, this actually is, uh, is my grid voltage. I denoted it by VG, VG. Okay. Now, uh, this, uh, in this scalar product, we can now multiply both sides with a part transformation because you know that a unitary matrix, if you put it on both sides of an inner product, then uh, it remains unchanged. That is a basic property of a unitary transformation. So this is equal to U of theta, Vg, inner product with U of theta, uh, I, yeah? So this is equal, so this is because it is unitary. And then this, I can write it as V uh, D I D plus V Q uh, I Q. Sorry, again, I forgot to put the G. G, G plus V G zero I Q zero. Uh, sorry, 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 I zero, I zero, I zero. Now you see, uh, this is the inner product in the park transform domain, and this is the inner product in the original ABC domain. I think you just before you denoted VG two is zero, not VG D V D two V D zero. Ah, I okay, 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 okay. I I did not put G here, so okay, fine. V V Q V D V Q and V zero. Okay. VQ and V0. Okay. So because the path transformation is unitary, this is the same as it. And now here, remember again, that from this equation, we have that I0, we have from here, that I0 must be zero always. Yes? And for this reason, we can, neglect this term. So it is just simply equal to VD, VQ, uh, sorry, VD ID plus VQ IQ. So this is the well-known expression for the active power uh, that is sent by the machine to the grid, VD ID plus VQ IQ. You see that this is the scalar product between the two dimensional vector VDVQ and the two dimensional vector IDIQ. Now, this uh, power is, uh, of course, an important uh, quantity, but it does not completely describe the currents which the machine sends to the grid. Uh, remember, these are now two, two vectors in the two dimensional plane. VDVQ and IDIQ. So in order to completely characterize these two vectors, you need the scalar product of them, and you need also the vector product of them. Uh, I don't know if you remember from high school, uh, the, in, the scalar product between two two-dimensional vectors is a length of one times a length of the other times a cosine of the angle between them. 
and the vector product would be again the length of one times the length of the other times the sine of the angle between them. But if we write it in terms of coordinates, then the vector product between the two would be uh, VBIQ. Where is it? Here. V, uh, v, no, sorry. VQ. VQ ID minus VD IQ. This would be the vector product between the two vectors. And this is called the reactive power, which the machine, or in fact, any device is sending uh, to the grid. So this is, this is active power. This is active power. And this is called reactive power. But this is, uh... It's power, so the direction doesn't mean anything like uh, because the cross product is orthogonal. No, in a, in a two dimensional uh, geometry, the vector product is just a number. Right. It's just like the so inner product, it's just a number. So it is this number. We don't assign a direction to it. In three dimensions, of course, it, it would have a direction, but here, no. So uh, these two quantities, if now you use the expressions for V and if you, if you now use these, these expressions for VD and VQ, these, then you get very simple expressions. You get that P, where should I write it? Uh, okay, I, I cram it here some. You obtain that P, is equal to minus V times uh, IQ uh, cosine delta. Yes, because V minus V times cosine delta, that would be VQ, right? And this I multiply with IQ, VQ with IQ. And then similarly, I have to add plus ID uh, sign of the so this is uh, the power expressed using the dq coordinates of the current and the power angle and similarly i can express q as being minus uh, sorry v times iq sine delta iq sine delta uh, and minus id uh, cosine. Yeah, I just substitute here the expressions which I have here, and I obtain these two nice equations. And this, these two equations have a very nice property that uh, you obtain PQ as a as a certain rotation matrix in uh, in terms of delta multiplied with ID IQ. So let me. Write that. What can I write it? So you have that's a vector PQ. Is equal to. Uh, so we use from there, so it's uh, V times, V times. Now I have here uh, a rotation matrix. Uh, so I have uh, cosine delta, cosine delta. Uh, minus. Okay, but I have to put a minus here. Uh, cosine delta uh, minus sine delta. And then on the second line, I have IQ again with a um, let me write here that here I have um, ID, IQ, IQ, ID. Now, 
that you see uh, in Q, I have IQ gets multiplied with sine delta. So, something is wrong here. Yeah, there something, is, uh, there is, something uh, is wrong. It's supposed to be minus sine delta. It should be minus, but it, it, I don't want it to be minus. There is there is a mistake somewhere. So if you take the V, uh, instead of minus V, if you just take V, the top would be minus plus delta and minus sine delta, and then it would be sine delta and minus cos delta. Mm -hmm. There is something wrong with V. There is something wrong. Uh, le le let us check it because this, there is something wrong here. Uh, P. So certainly I, this formula is for sure correct. So let's see. If I substitute VD is equal to, uh, oh, I deleted it. Uh, VD is, uh, where is it? Ah, you put a minus there, uh, there shouldn't be a minus there. Yeah. On sine delta uh, on your right. Yeah. VD is minus V sin delta. Minus V sin delta, that's uh, VD times ID. So this is correct. Both are correct, but there yeah. you shouldn't put a minus in sin delta yeah. in the elements one, two. Yes. Ah. Yeah. Ah, okay. And then here is a minus. Yeah. Okay, good, no, good. No, no, no. No? Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Minus, minus? Yes, yes, yes. okay. And then the, 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 finally, the ID, is multiplied with minus cosine delta, but with a minus it becomes, so it becomes cosine delta, yes. Okay, thank you. This is now correct, yeah? Okay. So now, this is a famous rotation matrix. This is the matrix of rotation by delta. Rotation by delta. And you know that the matrix of rotation by delta can be inverted and it is its inverse is a matrix of rotation by minus delta. So I invert this matrix and I obtain ID IQ is equal to minus one over V. So I invert in this. And now here I put the rotation by minus delta, which is cosine of delta. Uh, minus sine of delta, sine of delta, uh, cosine of delta. So this is rotation by minus delta, yeah? Uh, multiplied with P and Q. So you see from here, I can obtain from the powers from P and Q, which can be measured uh, relatively easily. We have uh, many devices which can measure active and reactive power. You can obtain ID and uh, IQ. And from this formula, if you then have ID and IQ and also P and Q, you can obtain um, and, uh, delta. You can compute delta. I will not do that, but. If you want from here, you can express delta. Usually, delta is not easy to measure directly. But uh, from this formula, you can expect delta. I just have a very uh, basic question about what yes. exactly is reactive power? Oh, what is reactive power? That's a hard question. Uh, well, uh, of course, the stupid answer is that this is re reactive power is this by definition, yeah? Uh, it is very difficult to, to give a meaningful answer to what is uh, uh, reactive power. It is uh, uh, in, in a one phase circuit, the reactive power would be uh, the power that uh, circulates, uh, but without producing any active power. So it is uh, power that it I mean, is, it is that doesn't do any work. So it is uh, like the, the power coming to a capacitor or the power coming to an inductor from a two dimension, from a one phase uh, network, yes? That would be current flowing, but no power is produced or consumed because for some of the time power is coming and for the remaining time power is going and then it adds up to zero. So it would be some sort of uh, 
current flowing for without carrying any energy. In, in a one phase network, the, the reactive power can only be defined by averaging over a whole over a full period. Then you can compute reactive power because some of the time energy is coming and some of the time energy is going. But in a three phase network, you see that the reactive power is an instantaneous variable. You can, you can define it at any given moment using this formula, yes? But now what is for you the intuitive interpretation of this formula, that's very difficult to, uh, to tell. It is somehow a complementary quantity to the uh, active power because uh, you, if you are thinking in terms of path transform, then you have the voltage vector, which is two dimensional in the part, in the BQ coordinates. It is two dimensional and you have the current vector, which is also two dimensional. And then you have uh, two complementary quantities, the scalar product and the vector product. One goes with the sine of the angle and the other goes with the cosine of the angle. So this is uh, somehow, I don't know. It's, uh, it's a quantity that is uh, difficult to give a precise, a, a very clear intuitive meaning other than saying, okay, this is what it is. This is the formula for it. But you can but, always measure it. Sorry? In a three phase, you can always measure it. Yeah, of course you can measure it. It's, uh, uh, I mean, once you can define it, it means you can uh, measure it. And uh, you will see that uh, this quantity actually has, uh, when you continue the analysis, then uh, 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 you see that it has a, a big importance in many areas. Uh, for example, you can influence the voltage on a power line by injecting uh, either positive or negative reactive power into this line. If you inject positive reactive power into a line, then uh, uh, you are actually rising its voltage and the opposite. If you extract reactive power from it, you draw the voltage down. You, we, we will get to that, uh, to, to actually seeing that. But uh, it's very difficult to, to give an obvious intuitive meaning to this uh, reactive power. I just asked because I uh, uh, yes yes this, uh, you, you are right many many people struggle to explain what does it mean reactive power and articles have been written trying to give various interpretations of uh, reactive power but um, I don't know any good uh, any good way to explain it other than to say that it is it. It's a complimentary or so <laughs> Yes. Uh, OK. Now, uh, now we go back to this. Um, uh, OK, if, if, you, if we have defined here the active and the uh, reactive power, and uh, usually people also define what is called a parent power, a parent power. S is the square root of P square plus Q square. So you understand that uh, this is, uh, since one is, uh, since uh, here, this is proportional to the cosine of the angle between the voltage vector and the current vector. And this is proportional to the sine of the same angle. So you, you have, cosine squared plus sine squared is one. So in total, this is equal to, this is equal to uh, I, uh, uh, the, the I dq, the dq vector. So the vector of I d and I q in uh, absolute value times the voltage vector dq also in absolute value and without any cosine or any sign. Yes, so this is a, 
uh, uh, apparent power. And the, the apparent power, this is D, DQ, yeah, DQ. So, uh, how can we obtain uh, Wait, that is the, what do you mean the absolute value but it's a vector you mean the norm uh, that's a, I mean the norm I mean uh, the norm uh, but in two dimensions I use the notation absolute value because it's like the complex plane uh, okay. uh, in my mind it's uh, two dimensional vectors are like complex numbers so I put absolute value. okay uh, okay, so now uh, let's go to back to this expression. You see here, P, uh, let's assume that you manage to control your uh, synchronous machine to produce a certain amount of active power and a certain amount of uh, uh, reactive power that you want to produce. So you, you, you put a set value for the active power and a set value for the reactive power, and then P squared plus Q squared as you can see here, it gives you the apparent power. And if the apparent power is then proportional to the absolute value of the current times the absolute value of the voltage. So if you divide it by, so this is apparent power squared divided by voltage squared, this gives you current squared. And current squared times RS, this will give you precisely the power spent on the on the resistance. So this, this term here is a power uh, dissipated on the resistance. Power on resistance. And then you want to produce an active torque Tm which when multiplied with omega, so the mechanical power, this is a mechanical power. This is the mechanical power. Yeah. So the mechanical power that you produce must be equal to the electric power that goes to the grid plus the power wasted on the resistor. Okay, so now we have a sort of a model of uh, a synchronous machine. Uh, this model is, uh, is a simplified model for many reasons. So uh, let me give you a few reasons why this model is not a full model of a synchronous machine. One model, uh, one reason I already told you the uh, expressions for the mutual inductances and also the self inductances of the various inductors, the stator inductors and the field inductors are not equal to the expressions that I told you in the previous lecture. I told you, for example, that the self inductance of each stator coil is constant. In reality, this is only an approximation. The self inductance of every stator coil changes in time according to the angle between the rotor and the stator. So when the uh, rotor is aligned with that uh, stator coil, then the self-inductance of that stator coil reaches its maximum. And when it's perpendicular, then it is uh, at the minimum. So that's one reason. But you can build, some machines are built in such a way that this is really a very small deviation. So the, uh, so the self-inductance of the stator coils is almost constant. So this is, let's say, a uh, minor problem. Another problem uh, is that um, uh, the, all these coils are uh, done on, uh, iron, on an iron core. So you have uh, iron cores in, in the rotor and also in the stator. And these iron cores have a nonlinear behavior. They have hysteresis and they have saturation. Yes, you know what this phenomena mean, hysteresis and saturation. So our model ignores the hysteresis and the saturation. So let, let, so let me uh, uh, 
uh, make a list. We have ignored. One. Um, what was the first? Uh, what the, ah, yes, uh, uh, variable, variable, variable. L. L, you remember, was the self-inductance of the state or winding. Then we have ignored hysteresis and saturation of the cores. Of magnetic cores. Oh. Then three, we have uh, ignored um, uh, damper wind. That's quite an important uh, thing. Damper wind. So what are damper winding? Uh, in a real synchronous machine, in a real synchronous machine, you have the rotor. So this is a rotor, and on this rotor, you have a uh, you have the the rotor winding. Yes. So this rotor winding produces a magnetic field in this direction. Yes. And of course, this rotor rotates. Yeah, it rotates. Now, in addition to this rotor uh, winding, to the main rotor winding, there are additional windings. One is in this direction, and it is short circuited, short circuited, and there is also a perpendicular one. in this direction, and it is also short circuited. Now, this, uh, this, um, this short circuited winding in the direction of the rotor coil is called the D, this is called the D direction, D axis. And this, this is called, this is called the Q axis. So uh, this also explains the origin of the spark transformation, because uh, how was this spark transformation invented? Uh, the stator creates a rotating magnetic field, and some of this, some of the currents produce uh, oh, in the stator produce a magnetic field which is aligned with the rotor uh, uh, main with the rotor D axis. And those currents are called the decomponent of the state of currents. Yes, and some other currents produce a magnetic field which is orthogonal to the D axis. And those state of currents which produce a magnetic field orthogonal to the D axis, which means the Q axis, they are called the Q component of the state of current. Yes, so this is the origin of the concept. Uh, Park uh, was trying to express the currents which produce magnetic field in the D axis and in the Q axis. Uh, the D comes from direct, direct axis, and this is called quadrature axis. Okay, now what is the role of these two uh, damper windings? So uh, the first question, of course, is. Do they disturb the fact that they are short circuit? 
does it disturb the uh, the d-axis uh, magnetic field? It does not, because the d-axis magnetic field is meant to be constant in the rotor. And if you have a short-circuited winding in the same direction in which you want a constant magnetic field, that actually helps. It helps because if this magnetic field would want to change, then you know the voltage induced here would be minus the derivative of the magnetic field in this direction. And since this is short circuited, it means that that change must be zero. So this uh, coil actually uh, forces the d direction magnetic field to be constant. Of course, it will not be exactly constant because this short circuit is not a perfect short circuit. There is some resistance here, but it tries to make this magnetic field constant. And similarly, this coil tries to make this magnetic field, the Q axis magnetic field constant. So in, if you want to have a full description of the machine, then you have to take into account the currents in these two uh, damper windings. So this current and this current, I don't even want to give them names now, but these two currents would be additional state variables. And then you have two more state variables in the description of the machine. And uh, what is, uh, what is the effect of these damper windings? Why are they called damper windings? Because I don't know, maybe some of you, probably many of you uh, know what is an induction machine. Yes? You, you know what is an induction motor or an induction machine? So in an induction machine, the rotor is uh, short circuited. The rotor is Let's take again ten minutes break. Ten minutes break. Okay, we continue to the last part of this uh, introduction to the synchronous machine. So, very quickly to go through this, uh, uh, the two damper windings, D and Q axis, when they are short circuited, they are actually just uh, very thick, big windings, uh, which are really short circuited. So the winding just goes around and uh, is welded together. The beginning and the end is, are welded together. Uh, and uh, these uh, windings uh, act as if there would be, in addition to the synchronous machine, a small, uh, induction machine uh, on the same axis. So it is as if you have uh, an induction uh, induction motor, as if you would have a small induction motor sitting uh, on the same uh, axis of the synchronous machine. And what is the effect of this? Uh, you know that uh, in, a, in an induction motor, the uh, rotor does not uh, rotate by this synchronous speed, uh, but actually the rotor rotates with less than synchronous speed. And there is a, a parameter called slip, which is equal to omega uh, uh, g minus omega divided by omega. And if the uh, 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 if the induction motor rotates with uh, 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 no, it should be the other way around. I'm sorry. Omega minus omega. Okay. Uh, no, no, because you want it to be positive to sleep. No, I'm sorry. It was correct. It was correct. Omega g minus omega over omega g. Okay. So if uh, the, the, the machine remains behind the grid frequency, so it rotates slower, which is normally the case, then it, it develops an electric torque, which is proportional, proportional to this slip. So this would be the electric torque of the, of the, of the damper winding, yes, which develops as a proportionally to the slip. 
and the, as you as the slip becomes bigger then this fades away like this now we are only interested in this very narrow region around zero around here this is only of interest to us because the because the slip in a case of a synchronous generator will be very small the local frequency will be very close to the grid frequency so this slip will be very small so we are here in this linear region and in this linear region you see that there is an electric torque proportional to the deviation of the frequency from the grid frequency so that means that there is here a torque which a torque produced by the damper winding which is some constant let's call it uh, d damper winding times omega uh, g minus omega the local frequency remember what was the group torque the group torque the group torque was dp times omega nominal minus omega so you see it's very similar it's very similar but here we compare to the nominal frequency and here we compare to the actual grid frequency so both of these torques are pushing the uh, machine towards a desired frequency one pushes towards the nominal frequency the other pushes towards the grid frequency and both of them have a very strong stabilizing effect on the machine so these these uh, uh, torques the group torque and the the, the torque produced by the damper winding uh, both have the effect of stabilizing the system which you can see if you do a stability analysis for this very complicated nonlinear system this is a a nonlinear system of order five yeah, i have not yet told you all the equations there is still an equation i didn't tell you but it overall it is a nonlinear system of order five and then it is not easy to analyze the stability of this system but these torques help towards the stability they are damping torques and that's why we call this damper winding okay finally i want to mention one more aspect in which we have not followed exactly the uh, full equations of a synchronous machine it is a fact that uh, uh, the damp the group torque which i have written here is not really like this meaning that the prime mover cannot instantly detect uh, a deviation of uh, frequency from the nominal frequency because it takes uh, some time for the measuring instruments there will be a phase lock loop there will be an amplifier there will be some device which opens or closes a valve in order to push more steam into a steam engine or some other device there will be a time constant involved here and this time constant says that the true group torque is low pass filtered low pass filtered you see this so this is the Laplace transform this is a low pass filter with a time constant okay let's call it tau because otherwise you confuse it with the tau s so this is a low pass filter low pass filter times this expression which is dp times omega n minus omega all this laplace transform so the effect of the group comes back not directly but low pass filter and the time constant tau of this low pass filter can be several seconds which means that the effect of the group torque comes after a like, like a delay of several seconds it's not a delay it's a low pass filter but it is similar and that means that the stabilizing effect is not acting instantly and that means that the stabilizing effect is not as good as it should be because a stabilizing feedback a damping feedback in order to act well 
it should act very quickly. And uh, here we have this time delay involved, not time delay, it's a low pass filtering, but it is similar to a time delay. So there is a time constant involved in the group, and that uh, makes a machine less stable. Okay, these are the main differences that I know between our model, our simplified model that we have discussed, and the true model of a, a synchronous machine. There is one thing I forgot to say in the model. So I'm going back to tell you what I forgot to say. I forgot to tell you the for formula for the reactive power. So we have discussed here the de definition of the reactive power, which is still written here. And we have obtained also the equivalent formula uh, that is already now deleted, in which we had it in terms of sine and cosine of the power under delta. Yes. Now, if you do this computation further uh, uh, to, to obtain what is uh, actually Q, then you can obtain the following expression. Q is equal to minus MF IF times omega times uh, the inner product between I and cosine uh, of, the, the, of theta uh, as a vector. Yes? So this I uh, did not tell you. This follows from two, three lines of computations. It follows from here. Yeah? Now, this expression of uh, Q is uh, you can, if you want, you can express it also like this. You multiply here with square root of three over two. And then this, you divide by square root of three over two, and then you recognize that what is written here becomes the D component of I. Yes? So this inner product, if I multiply it with square root of two over three, then it becomes a decomponent of I. So we have this formula for, the, for Q. And uh, let me remind you the formula for the electric torque. Is it still written here? No, it's not. Okay, I write it now again. TE, uh, where was it? Is minus square root of three over two. You see it resembles. Uh, MFIF, that is also very similar, uh, times uh, IQ. So you see uh, the electric torque and, the, and Q can be expressed rather easily using ID and IQ. So this is now our simplified model of the electric machine. Of course, we have neglected one, two, three, four. Now, the question is, uh, is it bad that we have neglected one, two, three, four? That's one question. And the second, the more important question is, how do we build an inverter which uh, uh, behaves like this simplified model of a synchronous machine? So let me answer both of these questions. If we look at this list and uh, we say, okay, we build an inverter which, uh, which follows our simplified model. So is it better or worse than the true model? Then I, there is no true model. Is it better or worse than the more uh, precise model of the synchronous machine? So if we look at this uh, list, then we see that most of these um, simplifications that we have made are actually helping us. We do not use a variable L that actually simplifies the model without making it worse. Yes, it just means that we have managed to build a perfectly round rotor, which has the same magnetic properties in every direction. That's very good. It's a perfect rotor. Why not? So this will not make our model worse than a true machine. 
we have a neglected hysteresis and saturation. Hysteresis and saturation are bad phenomena which di disturb the proper functioning of a synchronous machine. So if we have eliminated them from our model, that will make our model actually better than the true machine, yeah? Uh, the absence of damper windings, no, that's not good. We, uh, we, that's not good that we have no damper windings and we can actually uh, add damper windings to our model very easily. We can add this term if we want. It's very easy to add this term, yeah? So uh, the damper windings uh, is, um, there is no advantage in having thrown them out, uh, but, um, but we can put the simplified model of a damper winding. This is a very much simplified model of the damper winding. Yes? And this simplified model, which has all the good properties, we can easily add it to our Maybe model. You mean the one above? Ah, yes, I'm sorry, the one above, yes, this one. This is a very much simplified model of the damper winding, and this we can easily incorporate it in our model, right? And finally, the, the low pass filtering effect in the group. We don't have a low pass filtering. In our model, we can do instant group uh, uh, control. So we can have this effect without the low pass filter. That actually makes our model much better than the true model of the synchronous machine with uh, uh, prime mover. So we can actually build uh, a virtual synchronous machine, which behaves better than a synchronous machine, because we have eliminated one, three, uh, sorry, one, two, and four. And uh, regarding three, well, we can incorporate three if you want. This is very easy to add to our model. So in, in, uh, in, from all the, all the points of view, uh, our virtual synchronous machine will behave actually better than the true synchronous machine. Now, the second question is, uh, how do we do this? It's, So first I will present you the way it has been proposed in the original paper of, uh, um, in, well, not the, the original paper, in, a, in an old paper of mine with uh, Kim Chang Zong from 2011. So if I go at this old paper, yes. Then uh, I show you how uh, how the thing is uh, implemented. So we have uh, we build in the processor which controls the inverter. We build a model of a system uh, which behaves like this. We have the inertia one over J S. So here we add all the sum of all the torques. And then out comes omega. Yes, because the swing equation tells us that the j times the derivative of omega is the sum of the torques. So here we have to put the sum of the torques. So that means we have here the active torque Tm. You remember Tm. Then we have to add to it the droop torque Td. And we have to subtract from it the, uh, the electric torque, Te. Yeah? And this electric torque is obtained by a certain formula. It is minus m, uh, sorry, sorry, sorry minus square root of three over two, MF, IF, uh, IQ. 
Yeah. So what comes here is I. This is the electric torque. Now, what is the the, uh, the droop torque? It is um, equal to uh, the droop constant dp multiplied with omega nominal minus uh, omega. Yeah. So this is here omega nominal minus omega. Now, how do we obtain the angles? By integrating the angular velocity. This gives us the rotor angle theta. And this rotor angle theta goes to all the part transformations because we need several part transformations in this system. So this theta is used uh, there. And not only that, it is also used in the formula for the synchronous internal voltage, E, which is equal to uh, square root of, uh, which is MFIF, MFIF, uh, omega uh, inner product, uh, no, sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, sine tilde of theta. Yes, so this theta goes here, and here we obtain the synchronous internal voltage. Okay, now up to here. Everything that I have shown up to now, uh, and another thing which I have still not shown you, IQ. Uh, anyway, in this formula, obviously we need also IQ. I will talk in a second about this IQ. IQ. Which you, uh, sorry, 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 sorry. IF, IF. You need IF for this. Now, uh, this model, everything that is now on the board uh, is taking place as a simulation in the processor of the uh, uh, inverter. So there is no uh, actual physical component in this picture, yes? Now we have to get somehow also to the physical world. So that means that this E is somehow transformed into a real voltage. And for this, we have to feed this E into a PWM block. And if you go back to my first lecture, you remember that uh, a PWM generator, a pulse width modulation generator, will generate uh, switching signals to to the switches in an inverter so that this voltage will appear at the output of the inverter. So this PWM controls, controls the inverter legs, inverter legs, and the inverter will output the voltages, which we call, let's call them E tilde. And this E tilde is approximately equal to E. So E tilde, if we average it, if we average it over one switching period, which is very short, yes, then it is equal to E. So in the low frequency range, we can say that this E tilde is practically equal to E. And this E now is actually an electric line which is connected through an inductor ls and the resistor rs it is connected to the grid 
And as a result of this connection, there will be here a current, I. This is, of course, a vector, and this is also a vector, because I, I, this, uh, I put here this symbol, which means that this is repeated three times. It's a three-phase circuit, yeah? And this current is measured by a sensor, and this sensor transforms it uh, into, uh, so this is now a park transformation, park transformation, which receives this angle theta, this angle theta from here goes into this park transformation. And I obtain here IQ. Right? Now, Tm is generated according to the formula, which I have already told you. Uh, there is a formula which was written earlier today on the board. Formula. Such that if you put here P set, P set and Q set, that it generates Tm. This is Tm. Yeah? I don't write this formula again, yeah? So this is, happens inside the processor, or this happens in the processor. This part, this part is the real world. This part here is a real circuit. Real circuit. And now we have only one more question. Where does this IF come from? So uh, uh, do, I, do we still have the formula for, uh, no, we don't. Okay. The, the, it turns out, it turns out that if we increase IF, Intuitively, this is very clear. If we increase IF, it is as if we make the field of the rotor stronger. And if the rotor field that rotates is stronger, then it will induce higher voltages in the state of winding, right? So if we increase IF, then E will become larger. E right? the flux. The right. flux in the rotor, yes, if I increase it, then this E will be larger. This is clear from the formula. Yes, if I increase IF here, then E becomes bigger. And if E becomes bigger, then this Q, which again, I have deleted the formula for Q. So anyway, you, you where is it, the formula for Q? Uh, Let's, let's use the original formula for Q, this one. So we have the, uh, the measured voltages from here. We measure the voltages. We apply the part transformation. And we have now here uh, VD and VQ. And from the path transformation here, we have also ID. We have also ID. And now all these variables, ID, IQ. ID, IQ go, go here. And also VD, VQ go here. So the VD, VQ components enter from here. ID and IQ enter from here and out comes Q. Wait, something is missing here. Out comes Q. Now, there is a, a, a complicated story, which I did not explain you because that takes a long time to explain. That in a reasonable operating range, I worked it out recently with Pietro, who is sitting here, that in a reasonable operating range, 
uh, Q is an increasing function of IF. So if you increase IF, then Q will get bigger. And that means that here we can put an integral controller which compares Q with Q set. So you have here Q set with um, uh, plus minus. And you put here an integral controller. It's very cramped here, but okay. You put here one over K times uh, one over Ks. So that's an integral controller, one over K S, yeah? This goes in here and comes out here. So you put an integral controller from the error in Q to IF. If Q is too small, then this difference, this error will be positive. And that means that IF will increase. And by increasing IF, Q will increase, so it will reach Q set. And of course, the opposite direction as well. If Q is too big, then this difference will be negative, and then the integral controller will reduce IF. And again, in the end, the Q will converge to Q set. You know, you maybe you know that an integral controller has this pro property that it drives the error to zero. This can be proved very precisely, but uh, this is a long story. So if we put such an integral controller here, this, uh, this constant k has to be sufficiently big because if you want to make sure that the resulting closed loop system, which is nonlinear, should be stable, then you have to be careful with an integral controller that its gain should be sufficiently small. In other words, this constant capital K should be sufficiently large. And then for sufficiently large K, this will indeed stabilize the, uh, the Q, the value of Q to the desired value Q set. So now this is more or less the, uh, the implementation of a synchron data. Uh, as we have proposed it in our uh, paper from uh, 2011, but very similar uh, constructions have been uh, proposed also by other people. So I mentioned here the paper by Beck and Hesse and uh, another paper by Driessen and Wischer uh, uh, from the same period of time. They have proposed other ways to do it, which were more or less around the same idea, so that uh, I, I, we are not claiming to be the first to have done virtual synchronous machines. Uh, I, am, I have just shown you one possible way to do it, because, of course, I am most familiar with uh, what is in my paper, but uh, you should know that several people have proposed such uh, uh, virtual synchronous machines. And since then, in the last 10 years, there was a huge uh, development in this area. So nowadays, uh, a lot of uh, people accept that the best way to uh, control uh, inverters is to control them as virtual uh, synchronous machines. Now, this uh, implementation, which is this is the implementation from 2011, from my paper with Zong from 2011. But uh, since then, we have uh, understood that a lot of things in this implementation have to be changed, improved. And uh, I will tell you some of the improvements that have to be done. So, first of all, if you really want to have the, uh, the equivalent circuit of a synchronous machine, then you have to look at uh, and how, uh, what are the parameters of a true synchronous machine? And one of the things that you notice is that the, oh, I should have pointed out that in this implementation, the inductor, the filter inductor of the inverter, you see this comes out of the inverter legs, and this 
filter inductor plays the role of stator inductors, right? So the filter inductor of the inverter becomes the stator inductor. And this, at the beginning, seemed to us like an obvious, very nice solution, but it is not a good solution. Why? Because uh, in an inverter, this inductor, LS, is usually very small. And when I say very small, I say that in comparison to the corresponding stator inductor of a synchronous machine of the similar size. Actually, if you scale everything to the size of your inverter, so if you take an, uh, a virtual syn a synchronous machine that would have the same power as your inverter, then uh, the following striking difference becomes clear. If this inverter works at nominal power, then the voltage drop on this inductor, I'm telling at nominal power, the voltage drop on this uh, inductor is at most 5% of the nominal grid voltage, 5%. In a synchronous machine, if you would compute the voltage drop on the inductor, on the equivalent inductor L as of the stator, it would be approximately 150% of the grid voltage. So that's a huge difference between 5% and 150%, yeah? For this reason, we need here, if we want to model a synchronous machine, we need this inductor to be much, much bigger. Now, why do we want, why do we want to make this inductor as big as in a real inductor induction machine? This is a long story. It's not only that we want to make it to resemble a real machine, because that's not a, a goal in itself. Maybe it's better if it is small, but no, it is not better if it is small. You can do stability analysis of this nonlinear system, which is very difficult, but several people did it, me also. And this stability analysis shows that in order to have this system stable, you need a much bigger value of this inductor than what is usually available in a standard inverter. So it's not only because we want to resemble a real synchronous machine. It is because we want the system to be stable and stability requires that this inductor should be much bigger. So what can you do to make this inductor much bigger? You can, of course, put a much bigger inductor here. But that is a very bad solution because uh, inductors are very expensive, very big and very expensive. If you have, for example, in a 10 kilowatt inverter, you have here typically an inductor of between two millihenry and 10 millihenry. So that's about that big and it can cost 100 euros. If you want to make this inductor 30 times bigger, then it has to be physically 30 times bigger because you will want the same current in a much bigger inductance, which means that the flux has to be 30 times bigger, which means you have to build it 30 times bigger. And that would be terribly big and heavy and terribly expensive. So that's not the way to do it. So the way to, uh, uh, to achieve a very big inductor here is to say that this is not our real circuit. We do this circuit virtually. So we put here actually LS and RS are not in a real circuit, but they are actually in a virtual circuit. This is now a virtual circuit. So LS and RS are just parameters in a simulation of a circuit. And that will, and now I can take LS as big as I wish. 
and this will give me this current, but this will be now my virtual current, virtual current, which is obtained by taking this voltage on one side, this voltage on one side, this voltage on the other side, and let the current flow on this virtual circuit from here to here. Okay, but now how, how do I get the true current? Uh, of course, this, this will no longer be here. This will be now directly connected because this is just a virtual, a virtual current, a virtual circuit. But how do I generate the real circuit? Well, I have now to construct current sources. I will not tell you how, but I have to construct current sources, three, because it's three phase. So I construct a three phase current source, which we will generate this current I virtual. So I have to construct a virtual, uh, not a virtual, a, a true current source, which is, uh, uh, so I have an inverter, I have the true inverter. This true inverter will have a control circuit, which controls the current, the output current of this inverter. And the output current uh, is uh, following a reference current so this current source has uh, its own controller. And this controller of the output current has a reference current and the reference current will be this virtual current. Moreover, this allows me an additional thing because this virtual current in a transient, if I have an ugly transient, then this virtual current might become very big. And I don't want my inverter to be required to give very big current because that could destroy my inverter. And if it doesn't, uh, okay, my inverter has protection circuit. So if I demand two big currents, then I, it will just shut down or not execute what I am asking for. So in order to avoid that, I take these virtual currents, but in DQ, in, uh, in part transformed variables, in B and Q, which are not changing part. And these, part transformed virtual currents, so virtual IB and virtual IQ, I can limit them by saturation blocks. And then after they pass these saturation blocks in order to avoid overcurrents, then the clipped ID and IQ, but clipped in the DQ domain, not in the time domain, not in the usual uh, sinusoidal domain, in the DQ domain, I clip them to be, well, to be limited to certain values, and then they become reference currents for my current sources, which generate the true grid current. So this is uh, the, the good way to, cre to create a synchronverter, and this is how um, we have built one, and many, many people actually have built uh, synchronizers uh, based on this idea of using current sources which are controlled by uh, uh, by virtual current. But why didn't we use current sources earlier when the uh, virtual circuit was smaller? Like, like uh, when there was PWM generator and then the chain was the main. Well, we do that. That's what we do. We, we build a current source using that RS and LS, which are the, the true inductor and the true resistor of the inverter. Uh. So this, this LS and RS are not, they're not real. They are not the, they are not the true filter inductor and the true filter resistor of the inverter. They are much bigger. To, to avoid any misunderstanding, let me put here LG and RG, this LG is much bigger, much bigger than LS, which is the filter inductor of the inverter. This is inverter. And this is virtual synchronous machine. This is the LG, which would be the stator inductor of the, of the generator that I am trying to imitate. Yes, this is 30 or 50 times bigger than this. 
And then the, the true circuit and the true output filter would have, of course, this value, NS. But then you control also E, you both control the currents and E. Like uh, the output. Uh, with this the algorithm control, uh, outputs E. Uh, no, no, no. It outputs the it virtual, outputs a virtual that are output. driving the sources of the yes. inverter. But yes. then what this, about the PWM that was controlled? The PWM, the PWM uh, controls, of course, the output voltage of the inverter in such a way that, that the output sense, current exactly. should approach this virtual current. Yeah, so yeah. the it's output of you can't this have whole circuit, the output is this. This virtual current is the output variable from all this circuit. Yes. And this virtual current goes to current sources. So first it goes to limitation, yeah, yeah. and then it goes to current sources. So it is like a reference to the current source? It is yeah. like a reference to the current source. And then you have the yes. grid. And then this the current source is connected to the grid. And uh, in the physical circuit before the current sources, you have E that is exactly E that would generate. No, 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 no. Here I don't have. Uh, ah, uh, don't have I have uh, something else which is not E. It is okay, G. I call ah, it. I remember, remember now uh, because then uh, G would be yeah. what you need. Uh... There will be, of course, an output voltage here, but that has nothing to do with this E. Okay. That is just an intermediate variable in order to get the current source. Yeah. Okay. Now th there are many other details here which uh, I could uh, go on for a long time explaining the technical details of how to do this. But in 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 the, in uh, as a big picture, uh, I hope that you understood the yeah. the structure of how to build a, a VSM. Okay. So thank you for your time. Uh, does anyone have questions? Any questions? No questions. Okay. See you at the annual review tomorrow. <laughs>